Hi guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous, I do mean over the top beautiful day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in paradise. It is a uh, gorgeous Friday afternoon somewhere around December 16th, 2022. Not sure when this interview will be airing. We are in Santa Barbara, California, in paradise in Santa Barbara, California, where it is finally, I think I announced, when was, when was it, uh, 11 and a half months yeah. ago that I would be uh, having this man on my show in the next two weeks. Well, <laughs> a year later, guys, it is my great honor to finally bring aboard the uh, newest rising star in the Doomosphere. The meteorically rising uh, new kid on the block in the Doomosphere. <clears throat> My good buddy. Is it Doctor? Yeah, sure. It's to you. Yeah, it's doctor. to me, doctor. doctor. Professor. Professor Elliot Jacobson. And we are sitting in his little private oasis in his backyard. And it is, it, brother, it is. it is great to have you on board. And uh, so we're just going to dive in for the next somewhere between 30 and 59 minutes talking to Elliot Jacobson. I have actually been here for three days. This man and I have been blabbing back and forth all together for over 24 hours and, and we have how much of that time have we been discussing doom? Uh, um, not a lot actually no I mean really it's just been our life stories you know just all the strange things that's yeah. happened to us over these years yeah I mean just like like the first day you came here, it's like uh, the first thing you said to me is, "You don't know me at all. You know nothing about me, right?" <laughs> and I I would say that was that was a fairly accurate statement. I mean, in spite of the fact that I have I you have been on YouTube for you know a decade and and you have a thousand videos, the real you is. is unbelievable the stories you tell yes yeah, so we're just we're, we're just making friends is what uh, and, and and this man I can tell is gonna be one of my lifelong friends but we, we we haven't even I've barely even mentioned neither one of us really asking each other about our rise to the doomosphere so we're gonna do a very quick uh, cliff notes version uh, Elliot is as far as I know, he was a professor of mathematics for quite a while and went from there into the casino industry, which you can, which is where he's, this guy is a big fish in the casino industry, guys. If you're into the casino industry, you might know, you might know Elliot's name. So, uh, but we're not going to spend much time. Just give us a, what I want to talk about from that, obviously, you must have been looking at probability. You are a studier of probability, so we're going to talk about probability. Uh, but first, as I, I, I want to hear, was your tell us about how you went from the casino industry, which don't take this wrong. On some level, sounds like a clueless moron industry. On some level. You know what I'm saying. Yeah, it, no, it, no, believe me, it, I You wouldn't expect no. somebody yeah. to go from the casino industry into being a doomer. So was this a, was this a Seneca Cliff dive or was it a gradual? So how did you go, get from there to here, brother? You know, sometimes inside of you, you just, there, there's sort of like this part of you that you kind of know is like this seed, this, this, this thing that's been itching for, you know, a long part of your life. And, you know, I was in the environmental uh, movement. I grew up in California, right? So I went to Earth Day in 1977. I went to, uh, you know, see Timothy Leary. I went to the Rainbow Gathering outside of Truth and Consequences, New Mexico, you know. I was sort of a uh, a socialist, so I was on the streets, you know, marching, and, and really growing up in the, the 70s as a teenager, you sort of brought out, up, especially in California, about environmental issues. So, I mean, in a large way, that was always on my mind, environmental issues, and the question is, how did how did environment go from, okay, you're, you have that, and then you're a math professor, and then computer science, and then you're in the gambling, and then it's like, oh, now I'm, you know, a doomer, right? I, I believe in this stuff. And, uh, I mean, quite honestly, I, after I retired in 2017, um, 
We were just I, talking five years ago. Yeah, five okay. years ago. I, I, I was looking for things to do. Now I'm retired and let me volunteer, do every volunteer thing I could. And one of the first things I did was uh, to volunteer at our local zoo as an elephant docent. So I learned all about elephants, right? You learn every... Cause about how screwed elephants are. Well, how, how <laughs> to, to borrow your language, how, how fuck they are, right? Am I allowed to drop that uh, word? Uh, yeah, words? yeah. Uh... <laughs> I, right. Not, not kid-friendly necessarily. At any rate, I mean, day after day for two years, right, I'm, I'm answering questions about elephants. And uh, then both of our elephants died. You know, um, and one was 47 and the other was 48. And, um, you know, I had great affection for these elephants. I, I knew them very well. I saw them several times a week for several hours. And, um, you know, we would travel around to different elephant, uh, see elephants everywhere. And, and so I think, uh, you know, you might call it kind of a, uh, the aftermath of a death experience. You know, like, like here is this, this magnificent animal, right? And, uh, just to just to have that happen, it's just like like my heart just sank. You know, it's like yeah, this is what's I I cannot deny this another minute. I cannot deny how I feel about uh, what's happening, and um, yeah. So that, I would say that was really a moment for me when a it lot was of an this elephant stuff. epiphany. Uh, yes, an el epiphany. El epiphany. Yes, thank you. I, I mean, all you can do is laugh. I mean, I, 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 I pro yeah, I think other people have had L epiphanies. Um, but I mean, it's not just that. I, I've traveled the world, like looking. You know, we went we went to Australia to visit the uh, koala sanctuary outside of Brisbane, right? And you know, uh, my wife and I have like gone. We go everywhere to visit animals, all over the planet, right? And it's like it doesn't matter where we're traveling. We want to track down whatever the local you know thing is that's happening. We'll go visit that. So. So, you know, when you, when you actually get attached to really magnificent, charismatic animals and then you realize what's happening to them. Oh, it, the it koalas just, are totally scary. Oh, yeah, well, the koalas. That was before the fires, right? Oh, well, that's one thing. But, I mean, what people don't realize is koalas uh, have a, a venereal disease. Yeah, chlamydia. Chlamydia yeah. That, that's wiping out the population. Yeah. There's this huge issue with, I mean, yeah, and the fires and the, and, uh, the mines and everything they're doing now and, and you know, yeah, the, I mean, the koalas are, are like, like, Australia has 20 million people. They have 44 million kangaroos, right? And they have you know, maybe 30,000 koalas. That's, that's the decimation that's gone on there. It's just, it's just so sad. So I don't know. So I would say that, that the, being somebody who's cared about animals really all my life and then just starting to really realize, you know, shortly after I retired, like, like in very real terms, what's happening uh, was a big part of that for me. So you became a doomer in the year 2017? Um, well, I'd say I was probably a doomer during the, the Reagan administration. And then it you got know, put on the back burner for... A little bit, yeah. you know, you raise a family, I uh, have two kids, yeah, yeah, you know, and, yeah. and uh, you have a career and jobs. And, yeah. and uh, you know, and, and my days in the casino industry made me very, uh, even though, you know, I gained some recognition, some fame in that, it made me very cynical towards humanity in general. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, day after day you're walking through casinos and seeing like the most basic urges and instincts of humanity, this greed thing, right? And and. I mean, what people don't realize about casinos is that it, it's really just a big math theorem playing out very slowly, right? So, so you do the math and you know that's gonna end, right? And I can run a computer simulation that runs 100 million hands of blackjacks in five minutes, right? And so then I sit at a table and it's, it's running at 60 hands an yeah, hour, yeah, right? Yeah. I know how, what's gonna happen, right? Because I, I, I know. <laughs> I've, so it, it's an excruciatingly boring thing to watch people you know go through this this hope right? this hope I'm saying the word hope I get to say hope you, I know you have an issue with that word but, but you we're see, gonna talk about that in a few minutes you see you see all of this hope right over and over and over again that's what people walk through that door with hope and I know that I'm on the other side of that equation I am the the person who's doing the math to to uh, use their hope against them right to use their hope to get their money yeah. so it's a very cynical profession right so yeah certainly I went from that cynical profession to saying okay now what can I do that's good for the planet right because that was closing that door just opened up everything else in my life retired that had been kind of on the back burner um, but I mean that paid well right and and I don't pay better than being a doomer I'm it, taking it, a wild guess there brother it, it, it paid <laughs> 
much better than when I was a math professor. It paid better than when I was a, a <laughs> computer science professor. It paid better than, you know, it allowed me to retire five years, you know, at age 59. So, you know, in Santa Barbara, right? So, so yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm not proud of that. And it's funny, I actually went to a psychologist. You know, I was seeing a psychologist to help me uh, deal with the con conflicts I had about being in the casino industry. And I was explaining to my psychologist about, you know, how conflicted I was about this, this, um, this emotional stuff. I was, I, you know, how I was taking advantage of people. And I was working for this industry that did this to people. And she says to me, she says, you know, I got people in here from from Raytheon who are talking about building guided missiles to, <laughs> you know I have, I have people who work on the alcohol I, you, you know give yourself a pass. I have people who build you know AR 15s you know that and she's like like look fine you work for the casino industry you are not you know this is nothing like like what I've seen so she kind of you know helped you through helped help me through, through again yeah so you used to run uh, mathematical models so we're sitting at the blackjack table right. gambling with this planet yes. at 60, what did you say, 60, 60 hands, hands a minute? 60 hands an hour. All right, I want you to put everything you learned in the casino industry, I want you to put this planet, we're, we're at the planetary blackjack table. All right, we are. We are we putting it all on black or... Uh, which, which side are you going to put it on? Which bet are you going to make? <laughs> well, in the climate casino, everyone's a loser. I don't care what, you know, 100% loser. There is no winning bet. And and it's not like, see, the thing in blackjack is you do the same thing over and over and over and over again, and you lose more and more and more. And you that's could, kind of what we're doing. And you could say <laughs> that, you know, every every day we get into our car, every day we go shopping, you know, every day we, we are consumers, every day, you know, we're using plastics or, or oh, yeah. you know, we're driving an electric vehicle that's using lithium or cobalt or, you know, whatever we are doing that is a um, uh, participating in this world. I think maybe the roulette wheel might be a little bit better metaphor than, than blackjack. Maybe. Well, uh, you know, the roulette wheel, you know, so I'm not exactly sure what's your question, Sam. Run a mathematical model on the roulette wheel is, I, I mean, is, is going, is the green energy revolution going from betting on the black, which would be the fossil fuels, to going and betting on the on the reds. You see what I'm? Are we just moving the? Are we just moving the bet? Uh, and, and we have the same. You see what I'm saying? Are, are we improving our odds of saving this? Are anything we're doing improving our odds to save this planet by your models? I so so yes yes is my answer. Oh really? I'm yeah. surprised to hear and, that answer. And, Expound upon that, please. Well, because my model says that every day I want to save as much of this planet as I can for whatever comes after humans. All okay. Right? So, yeah. so right. if that yeah. means, I mean, there's a famous saying, right? If I can, if I can save one uh, flower for one more day yeah. through everything I've, I've okay. ever done, then, then I've done enough, right? So, so yeah, so my volunteerism and, and what I do is not so much thinking about, oh, how can I save the planet for humans? It's, it's how can I save the planet for whatever comes after you? Hallelujah, brother. So, so yeah, is there a good choice, you know, between lithium mines that are going to, you know, <laughs> tear up another huge part between putting mirrors over vast deserts and, you know, between putting, uh, uh, you know, killing off uh, millions of birds with the propellers of wind, you know. It's just like, like, let's do as little damage as we can, right? And if the damage we're doing is sucking oil from the ground, right? Well, that's an established industry, you know, and yes, we're, we're digging more coal mines and we're putting in new plants and things like that. But, but you know, oil roughly, what do they say, about a tenth or a twentieth of the, of the ecological, you know, the geographic footprint of these other uh, yeah. alternative energies in terms of, you know, if you want to generate the same power from solar, you need what is it, 10 or 20 yeah, times yeah, the, the yeah. physical space? We don't have it on we, this planet. We, well, we don't have it. And, and the other thing is Jensen's paradox. You know, the more energy we, we generate, it doesn't matter how we generate, that's not, that energy is not going to replace fossil fuels, right? And, you know, what the, the statistic right now is that we would have to leave something like 90% of all fossil fuels that we are currently know the deposits and have plans yeah. to, to take that stuff out of the ground. We would have to leave 90% of that 
in the ground. Which ain't going to happen. Yeah, in order to, you know, meet the 1.5 or whatever. So, so yeah, so um, I am not pro-green in, in any way. I am absolutely 100%. And, it, it, you know, it, it, it's tough here in California because... You fossil fuel shill, you. That's, yeah, that's what you'll right. get if, you're, yeah, if, you're, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you say one word bad about that. You're a fossil fuel shill. I am a shill for the fossil fuel, you know, and, and maybe I am. I don't know, but, <laughs> but I mean, in the long run, I think humanity will, will be gone faster if we keep burning, you know, fossil fuels. And, and you know, that might be a kind of nihilism, but, but it's not because I love this planet. I love nature and I love the, the animals on this planet. And I genuinely, I, I genuinely want this planet to recover from us as fast as it possibly can. And you know, some humans may survive. You know, there there will be places where where humans will still be able to survive. I don't think we're going extinct or anything. You know, I don't think there's going to be run or runaway global you know catastrophe and we become Venus or anything like that. But um, you know, we still we still have to have in our mind this sort of as humans do the least harm, right? Choose the path that does the least harm going forward. And and right now, you know, if the least harm is between black, which is fossil fuels, and red, which is green energy, you know, and those are the only two choices. I mean, <laughs> I'm sticking with black, right? Yeah, now. I mean, well, it, it's six of one, but well, as a roulette wheel says. Yeah. Uh, so, in, in the beginning, which sounds like just a few years ago, I, I mean, what information did you, at, at what point did you pass the point? Well, let me ask you, are you an environmentalist? Um, yes, I am an environmentalist, which, which means exactly what I, I said. I interpret environmentalist to be, I want to save as much as I can for whatever comes after us, right? So if environmentalist means that I, I want to uh, get rid of plastics as much as possible well yeah because because animals species all over the planet are ingesting plastics and it's, uh -huh. it's making it very tough for them right so yeah to the extent that an individual industry um is more yes thank you thank you he, he, he just flashed the fact that i'm, I'm drinking water out of a Thank you, Sam, for calling me hypocrite. Right that he, ha million, he handed me a, a, a single-use plastic bottle of water. You. Let me just point out, because <laughs> you, you caught me on this one, that I reuse those bottles over and over ah, and over okay. again, right? I, I, will, right? I will bring a bottle out and take it to my tap. tap. You know, people use these recyclable uh, grocery bags from like Trader Joe's, right? You buy a, a Trader Joe's recyclable and you think, okay, now we I'm bought gonna... one two yes, hours I, ago. I bought one for you today. So $1.49 <laughs> at Trader Joe's. You buy that bag and the message is this bag will help save the planet, right? And then you actually look at the, the uh, number of times you have to use that bag yeah. to cause less ecological harm than the equivalent plastic well, you uh, got to think use. about what the hell a shopping bag was created for. Well, it's to fill up with, with, with a bunch of crap. Well, it's, maybe it's, at Trader Joe's is at least you're going to eat it. But you know, but but, but you know, to see a a, a, a recyclable uh, green shopping bag at Walmart, yeah. so you can re you can come in Walmart over and over and over again and fill up your Save the Planet bag with a I, bunch. You know, you know. But it, we're talking about the actual ecological footprint of the of the bag, right? So that bag. <laughs> destroyed the planet, right, a, a tiny bit in its creation. And the question is, how many plastic yeah. bags would you need to create yeah. to destroy the planet as much as this one yeah. reusable Trader yeah. Joe's bag? And, you know, I read something, it was like, like uh, I don't remember the statistics, but it was just so mind-blowing. It was like 3,000, you know, Yeah, 10 years. You would you know, you you'd have to use the, this. Yeah. Yeah. And these bags don't have that lifetime. Yeah. They, they simply do not last, so, through, you so know, 3,000. So what's the lesson? Well, well. <laughs> The, the lesson is that, that these things that we think are valuable and are, are saving the planet, you know, are, are just imbued with contradictions. They are, they are not what they seem. They are not, you know, green energy and recyclables and all these things. They are not that, you know, they are, they are you know, if you actually look at the numbers, look at the data, they are the opposite. Exactly. Of there you are. go. But so you realize this. But you, you well, also, also you realize, but, you, but you you also realize that yeah. one tenth of one that the vast majority of people calling themselves environmentalists do not realize this. Do you agree with that statement? Um, fortunately, I don't know that many environmentalists. There you go. So I don't know. I've never surveyed them on this particular uh, there, question. There, there. I'm not going to speak <laughs> I, for them. I, I don't know many either. So I'm glad to. Uh, so anyway. Uh, 
But when did you, but when did, would you have used the word doomer to describe, for the first time, did you use the word doomer to describe yourself? How, how recently? Um, that was after I read the essay, Facing Extinction, right, by uh, Catherine Ingram. And that was I, a good I, one. That was the first time I really understood what that meant in a, in a really deep, profound way, right? As a, as a path through life, as opposed to just an opinion about the future. Like, it, it, it is a philosophy of life that, that, that gets you through it, right? That uh, helps you um, um, decide which actions to take, right, on your day-to-day -day life. And it's not as, for me, it's not a cynical, oh, the world's ending, I'm a doomer, I, I hate everything. No, doomer means, for me, it means I don't have to care about politics because it doesn't matter, yeah. right? It, it doesn't matter who gets elected because that's not the issue, right? The issue, you know, they're all involved in the game, right? You know, I don't have to argue about a, a, a particular disease um, being, you know, or whether people should get vaccinated or not. That's not a fight I need to have with anybody. You know, I don't, I don't need to get sidetracked into um, philosophical conversations with people. I can, I can just focus on, you know, my premise about how to live my life philosophically. That's consistent with with the Doomer perspective, and so. Uh, yeah, so Catherine, Hay, uh, Catherine Ingram, not Catherine Hale. Not, not Catherine Hale. No, no, no. no, no, no. The opposite of Catherine Hale. <laughs> right. uh, Catherine Ingram was the, was the first person who really made me aware that there was a, a philosophical perspective associated with being a doomer. And then I'd say the second person was Jim Bendel, right? And I really understood his deep adaptation, and I, I took that to heart, right? I was like, like okay, let's really understand this and see if I can agree with this or not. And the answer was no, but, but you know, I don't want to have that conversation. But, uh, you know, he, he gives enough uh, uh, thought to what he's saying, right, that, that I really had to um, go through the arguments. And then I would say um, the next lineage was Rupert Reed okay. and uh, um, Hallam. Is it Roger Hallam? Yeah. yeah. So those guys are just... Um, well, at least Roger is the fire and brimstone of, uh, 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 you know, what's going to happen to the planet if we don't, you know, take 100% action now. And, of course, one of the uh, originators of the XR movement, uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, one of the original leaders in the leadership of that. So, um, and then, of course, I, I ran into our other friend that I, he whose name shall not be mentioned, <laughs> um, somewhere along the line and watched a bunch of those videos. And, and I uh, originally thought, well, there might be something to this. And then I just, you know, because I'm a mathematician and scientist, I was able to read the same papers. I was able to do my own analysis. I was able to. So here's one thing about me that I think is different from a lot of doomers. Okay. At least a lot of, a lot of that group is that I actually buy the science 100%. When I read the IPCC, right, I don't, sure, there are parts of that that are political documents. But a large part of that, I just say, okay, absolutely, I buy into this. This is, yes, we are currently at 1.21, you know, above pre-industrial, which is 1850 to 1900. Fine, I'm good with that. Here are all the possible tracks for the future, you know, and, and here's, here's what we need to do to meet those tracks. You know, what I don't buy into is the uh, belief that we're going to, actually meet these yeah you know these individual goals that are going to keep us below all the tipping points and, and the collapse from happening but the science itself i mean i i'm down with it and and uh you know people often want to ask me well do you think that uh, you know we'll be extinct by this year or we'll be um uh that the earth is going to heat up by this much or whatever you know or they'll say oh the earth is already heat gotten this hotter they'll make some claim about the arc about Siberian methane or, or methane clathrates East Siberia Arctic uh, stuff you know and I read the science papers right and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, because I, I published in referee journals myself because I know what it means to be a scientist and to, to, to go through that process because I know what it means to get, be a PhD at a, a research institution. I have great respect for these people who are, are scientists, so I, I buy into the science. What I don't buy is their own rhetorical views sort of, sort of layered on top of the science that, that you know, exaggerates or, or misrepresents what that science is saying. 
So yeah, I mean, once I started looking at the science, uh, there's no question that, that, was... that you look at science together with human nature, uh, and, and no question, yeah. Just no question. No, no question that we're done for. We're question. done for, yeah. The civilization is collapsing. The sixth great extinction is underway. They're at 100%. Absolutely. That, that's 100%. So your blog, which is excellent, but I have read, I, set, I think, three of your essays uh, over the past year. Watching the world go by, spelled B-Y-E. Tell us about uh, how that came about and how it's being received and all that. Well, you may remember uh, this uh, spiritual fellow named Ram Das. Oh, and, yeah. And he was... I am, uh, absolute, Richard... I am absolutely shocked that this man is... Uh, I, uh, I am shocked that Ram Das's name was mentioned in this so, conversation. So when I was about um, 16, yeah. um, I dropped some LSD <laughs> with these two young women, and they were just spectacular, gorgeous women. At any rate, it was very strong LSD. And we were in a little uh, kind of a, a house behind a, a pool behind my parents' house where I grew up in the valley. Um, and we were just, just flying, right? We didn't know what we were gonna do. And on the shelf in that little house was Be Here Now by, by Rondas, right? And I opened that book and um, for the next six or eight hours the three of us just read every page and it was absolutely 100 percent clear that that was written for us yeah, right? that, that oh, yeah, every cool. word on every page it was like that was meant for us that was you know he penned that and and so you know that middle part that's like the large pages you you read that stuff on lsd it, just, it, it takes it to a different level at any rate the very last page right of that remind me as i've been the very last years page and i'm not sure if i'm going to get this 100 percent correct is um, so so this is after all this philosophical yeah. discourse, right? Yeah. He shows a picture of this bridge over this this uh, river, and there's a person on the bridge, and the person is just sort of standing there, sort of uh, looking out over the water, just in a meditative moment, and he just says, "I'm standing on a bridge, watching the world go by." Ah, oh, so that's where it came from. And so that line, but not B Y A B Y. B Y, yeah. right? I, in other words, that's that's what okay. you know. That's your spiritual path is is we are here as observers. We are not you know we are here as pacifists. We are here to to do no harm. We're just watching the world go by. There it is. That's the world, right? Let's watch it go by. And so that has stuck with me my whole life. That that sort of uh, chemically induced spiritual experience. So when did we? go from watching the world go by BY to watching the world go by BYE. It was just a moment of inspiration when I started that blog. Was it right on the cusp between the two? When when, when did we pass the point of no return? Right about the time Be Here Now was... Be Here, be here Now while you still can? <laughs> well, I think we passed the point of no return somewhere around the time that, uh, that the oil, the humans first discovered oil. As soon as we learned how to, to burn coal, uh, that was when we... That's, that's when we passed, yeah. 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 Okay. So, you know, it's, it's once once we had the candy, when, once yeah. the candy was shown yeah. to us, I mean, we are a virus in a Petri dish, right? And we know who says that, right? We know whose analogy that is. You've interviewed... Uh, uh, um, so, all kinds of people Yeah, all kinds that. of people say it, but... but <laughs> it's become you know, almost a doomer cliche. It is. It's, it's so, right so, up there with that narrow, that rapidly closing window. Rapidly closing, uh, yes. <laughs> that virus in a Petri dish. Right, so anyway, so oil, oil, oil was the Petri dish, right? And so, so you know, we went from having... Um, you know, a thousand, two thousand generations of humans with yeah. almost no change in the standard of living. However you were born, that's how you're going to die, right? That, that's your life. Your life is, you're born at this level uh, yeah, of wealth for, for the world and you're going to die. And you with, live within six miles of where you were born right, for your and, life. And you're not going to have, <laughs> you know, a new type of car with a new type of battery and a phone yeah. and, and a computer and entertainment and clothes and airplanes and, you know, <laughs> weapons, right? However you were born, that's how the world is going to be when you die, right? And then oil in 1750, they start burning coal. And, uh, you know, what happens after that, after that coal gets burned? It's, it's uh, um, 10 what? generations, right? We go from a billion to 8 billion people in 10 generations and destroy the planet. So that, that there's no question that if humanity had never discovered oil, if that had never, you know, 
we would be today roughly where we were, yeah. you know. For for the first 200 generations. Yeah, yeah. And eventually humans were going to generate. Eventually yeah. humans would discover this. It, eventually it's going to happen. It's just, you know, uh, humans are just not compatible with with uh, life, <laughs> you know. We're not compatible with yeah. with living things. We just are a, a incompatible species. Uh, humans are not healthy for children and other, other living, living things. Yeah, that which is a bumper <laughs> sticker with the word war in, in it when we were growing up, right? War is not healthy yeah, was, for children and other living things. But I thought we were going to have a new one. Humans are not healthy for children and other living things. <laughs> it could be, yeah. I mean, but but it's, it, it's something innately human that got us there, right? It's not like It's not like oil is evil. Is that humans are this way, yeah. you know? And Gail Zawicki, right? She wrote about that over and over again about the fact that wherever humans were and whenever they were in the history of the planet, they would wipe out whatever, you know, trees or animals mm -hmm. or they whatever they could eat, whatever resources they can they could use up wherever humans were. So I mean, we've been destructive to this planet as long as we've been civilized in any fashion. But but it really, you know, got supercharged uh, around 1750. Yeah. And no way out. We backed ourselves into a corner and no way out. Well, no, there's a way out. It's just the way that things are going. I mean, the way out is... Oh, oh, oh yeah, 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 I mean, there's yeah, yeah, there, yeah. There's a 100% way out. <laughs> yeah. Again, I mean, my, my philosophy is let's try and leave the planet as good a shape as we can on our way out. I mean... The, the way out is 100% the way out, but if what, what you're saying is, is there a way out to avoid collapse? Is there a way out to avoid yeah. uh, um, mass extinction yeah. of the majority, you know, a huge number of species on the planet? Is there a way out for, for humans to not go through a bottleneck and, and you know, just, just uh, uh, no, 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 of course not. Um, yeah, of course not. And, I mean, we see that every day. That's what you do is you are... You are, uh, you know, in your own way, the, the chronicler of the day-to-day -day decline, whereas I'm taking it sort of a more scientific. It's like, it's like, okay, what are the things that are causing collapse? What are the things that are well, causing, other than humans? <laughs> well, That's okay. a one-word answer. <laughs> yeah, what are the things that, that could cause collapse other than humans? Of course, we could have uh, electromagnetic yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. bursts. We could have uh, uh, always a super volcano. We could have. But an we were dealing with impact. those before 1750. Yeah, but but <laughs> that list still that's that list has always been with us. But you know, uh, but pretty much not not counting that list. Right. Uh, everything on the list you you you, you peel that back. And it's humans. It is all, yeah, it's all humans. I mean, that, that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's. Um, I'm, I'm saying beavers are getting a bad rap here recently. So it's humans and, and beavers. I mean, there's other destructive animals, right? <laughs> I, I, they destroy their environment, right? I mean, uh, sure, an anteater, right? An anteater <laughs> destroys an anthill, right? From an ant's hill. perspective. Yeah, yeah I mean, <laughs> you know, obviously, Termite mounds are not compatible with, with anteaters, right? So, <laughs> fine. I'm good with that, right? Yeah. I'm okay with, with anteaters destroying termite mounds. By the way, I was also a docent for uh, um, the anteaters at the zoo for a while. So that was another one of my favorite species along the way. Um, but yeah, as far as humans go, uh, yeah, there's no way out if you're talking about can, is there some techno utopias or some you know way we're going to fix this and it's so funny like one of the things that was just in the news lately is this idea that that jets uh you know jet, jet airplanes jet right? airplanes when they are flying around they are are spewing these nitrous oxides these nox right and um this is not the greenhouse gas and 2 this is uh, this is um other types of, of of emissions and it turns out that those emissions help keep methane down and they discovered in the year 2020 when COVID hit and the world locked down a lot of the airplane traffic died away that methane we had like the record methane spike <laughs> and and they actually measured human anthropogenic methane for that year and we had decreased methane right there are no questions we had decreased methane but here we are because we're flying less we are not creating the chemicals that scrub uh. the methane from the atmosphere and so, 
So normally methane naturally decays, you know, it's scrubbed out by hydroxyl radicals. And because we're not flying, there's not as many of these hydroxyl radicals around to scrub the methane. So methane's shooting up because it, it's lifetime. And I mean, that's an example of the kind of uh, Contradictions. Uh, yeah. paradox that we're in. And yeah. it's similar to the aerosol masking effect with sulfates, right? That, that um, when shipping fuels in the, 20, uh, in the year 2020, shipping fuels uh, got cleaner, they went sulfate free, then uh, again, these sulfates reflect back solar radiation, right, which, which helps keep the planet cooler. So, you know, one of the things that happened is we don't have as much sulfates from shipping. And so as a consequence, we've had this superheating over these parts of the world that were normally being cooled by the local sulfates uh, emitted by the shipping. And so, you know, we're wondering so why we're, where are are you on that uh did you that aerosol masking and uh, where are you in that debate well i will tell you exactly because i i like i say i follow the science right and and the science is that that right right now aerosol masking if we were to completely eliminate uh -huh. all fossil fuels right sulfate emitting factories and all other sources of, of anthropogenic sulfates then we're talking about somewhere between about 0 0.5 and 0 0.9 degrees Celsius, right? So let's just call it roughly, roughly uh, right around, centered around one degree Fahrenheit, yeah. which is... Oh, Fahrenheit, okay. Yeah, nice. one degree Fahrenheit, roughly in that range, um, which would not be fun, right? It could push us from 1.2 to 1.7 in just a, you know, a very short period. But it's not the sort of catastrophic and end all civilization cause immediate extinction type of event. I don't know if you remember my interview with Tim Gat with Tim Garrett from the University of Utah. I, I saw it, but I don't know where. One, one, one of my top five uh, in interviews I've ever had. I mean, he's right up there with uh, with William Reese. But I was utterly, he, he's, an, he's an atmospheric physicist. Right. He completely laughs off any suggestion, uh, that, that the whole thing about this, he, he, he says it, 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 it's complete BS. Well, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't swallow one word of it, and, 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 and I was, I admit I was a little taken aback at just how he just utterly rejected it yeah uh, so you know i i am actually looking at not just one guy's opinion yeah. right so the, the well, it's a, it's a, i mean i'm not getting in a, in a debate I, I mean i don't know but I, i'm just saying a, 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 a someone who you know has spent his entire career and he's and is one of the most brilliant interviews i've ever had if tim garrett says sam don't worry about that. We have we have so many more things uh, that that is that that that's not even on the uh, on the list of things to worry about. Maybe if there weren't ten thousand other things, you know what I'm saying. But uh, compared to the other things that we need to be worried about, that that well, one, well, let me give you another with. perspective on that. <clears throat> it's not going to happen. Right, because we're not we're not going to suddenly stop using yeah. fossil fuels in there anyway. and stop uh, emitting sulfates, right? Yeah, they ain't going to happen. So, so if it's not going to happen, then yeah, Some... don't you know? It's not the same <laughs> level of worry that something that is going to happen should bring, right? Uh, it, like, like the this Thwaites Glacier, right? I mean, this is something that is, is going to happen, happen, right? So yeah, I mean, <laughs> as long as humans are around and consuming fossil fuels, we're going to have plenty of aerosols around, right? So so yeah, fine. It's not going to. And the people who say, well, yeah, if we stop using 100% fossil fuels today, then we'd all die from the aerosol masking. That that is just a you know. No, we would all die from starvation. Half of us would. <laughs> but it, it, it's the kind of argument that that is so nonsensical because the premise is impossible. And and in mathematics, right? In mathematics, there's sort of this this joke that if your hypothesis is impossible, yeah, then the entire statement is always true. So if you start with a if you start with <laughs> you know, a scenario that, that makes no sense, will never happen, is, is not a real thing, then you can draw any conclusion you want from it, and the entire statement will be true. You well, know? see, I mean, to flip the aerosol masking on its head, and this is, I'm just defaulting more and more the what I just consider these pointless debates and hopium and all of that stuff. It ain't going to happen. 
Right. Why, why are we wasting all of this hot air and ink on something every one of us knows it ain't going to happen? Well, the, compl ain't gonna happen. the complete elimination won't. But, I mean, what's happening with the shipping fuels is real, right? That is genuinely real. And um, a guy named Leon Simmons, who is an atmospheric scientist, has been tracking the, the total net uh, of they call it forcing the total net warming that's happening due to to these sulfates and and this is not you know on the on the same scale as, as uh you know civilization ending you know overnight catastrophic warming but it's also not trivial all right so right now um it if you look at the latest measurements of of the total amount of incoming uh heat to the planet versus the amount we're radiating back right the total amount of, of heat is, I believe it's equivalent to just over uh, 13 Hiroshima atomic bombs per second is the current number. And I just worked this out yeah. about uh, a few months back based on Leon Simmons' numbers. Um, so how fast is the planet heating up right now? Imagine lighting off 13 Hiroshima's a second, right? 24-7, you know, <laughs> uh, year round. And out of those 13 that we're lighting off, 12 of them are going into heating up the ocean, Yeah. all right? So that's how fast the ocean is heating up. And why is it heating up? Well, one of the reasons is we don't have these, these sulfates over the ocean reflecting yeah. back the heat. So that heat is, you know. Um, so the next, the next El Nino we're going to get, which is right now predicted for late 2023 into 24, and actually right now ENSO is giving that a 50-50 chance of an El Nino right then, uh, is going to start releasing that heat. And the IPCC, or it might be, um, I might have the, the wrong um, attribution here, said that there was a 50-50 chance of, of temporarily crossing 1.5 by the year 2026, all right? So I'm actually going to go on the record and say there is a 50-50 chance, you probabilities, right? There's a 50-50 chance we are going to break 1.5 in the year 2024 based on an El Nino yeah. and the loss of aerosols due to uh, shipping. Um, fuels being cleaned up. So, you know, that's, that'll, it may just last a year. It might be that we go back to La Nina and it cools down a little bit again. But what's going to happen in just the next few years is going to be absolutely brutal. Just brutal. And what's that going to look like to uh, y you and me? Not, not, not the people in Somalia. What's that going to look like? Well, tell us about your own backyard. What did your backyard look like five years ago compared and it's still beautiful but tell me what it looked like five years well ago. five years ago let's go back 10 years because okay. that's when we had to start uh so the drought here is you know um how's that sun in my face it, like it's, it's fine all right um so the drought here has been been brutal we've essentially had two years where it's rained a normal amount since the year 2010 um and so uh in 2013, we had fruit trees, we had lawns, we had, you know, we had um, all sorts of, of other plants around my yard. You know, I, I had roses and, and all sorts of flowers and, and vines and all this stuff, right? And I've just been systematically replacing that with cactus and palms and rocks and decomposed granite. And I, you know, I had a watering system where I would, I would push a button and it would just uh, yeah. go around all these different things and it would turn on the water and the sprinklers yeah, yeah. would go, you know. And uh, water now costs about, um, I don't know, uh, probably 5x what it did just, just five years ago uh, to water my yard. It two, what, two more years here? Well, it had... it's, so, so we got down, so we have a reservoir locally right here. Our reservoir got down to 7% capacity uh, in like 2016, 2017. Um, and so, you know, complete citywide ban on watering everything. We're, and then we had, fortunately, one good water year, I think it was 2018 or 2017, was our last uh, full year where we got above average rain. Uh, the last three years in La Nina, we have had a wet October through December, and then it's just stopped. It's just quit on us. Like, like, like 2020 and 2021, just we thought going into December, the drought's over, we're all gonna, you know, be happy. And then it just stopped and it got 75 or 80 degrees in January and that's how it is, right? And that's, you know right now because uh, that's what the weather's predicted to be, right? Going that's forward. why I'm sitting here instead of in Canada, New in, York. In, yeah, <laughs> New York. So, so it's crazy, you know, it's just crazy. And so, um, you know, it gets so hot here now. Never used to get this hot. It gets so hot here now 
that are, are, um, are agaves, right? The things that are like supposed to be able to handle heat uh, get burnt and start wilting. When, when your agaves start withering in Santa Barbara, uh, it, we're, 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 it's not normal. It's, it's not normal. That word normal. Well, anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit. See, this is what, uh, how long do you think we've been talking? 42 minutes. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, pretty close. Right, right in there. Uh, this is why I'm saying this. Why did I choose 42? 42 is the answer to, uh, right, from, um, nope, never mind. I, right, I, 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 never mind. This is a cultural reference. Yes, I, I am proud of Believe my... Believe me in the comments, when this comes okay. out, everybody's going to tell you where the number 42 I, comes I, from. I am proud of my inability to recognize the vast majority of cultural references. Most cultural references go right over my head. Ram Dass, you, you got that? Oh, okay, that was... Uh, Okay. Timothy Leary, I bet. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, we won't go into 93. Uh, yeah. So anyway, but I do want to spend a few minutes on the H word. Uh, what is that word? I'm not sure what uh, word. You're, what word? Uh, huh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, huh, I, I still don't get what you're uh, saying. Uh, huh, huh, uh, 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 Oh, hope! You were, there you go. You want to talk about hope? I I, uh, I want you to talk about it because it would it would fill up the rest of our, our fourteen minutes here. Uh, oh no, it, no, it, I it, can't, I, I can't. So, so um, this I you I you read one of my essays uh, a, a, like a, a month or two months back about and, uh, uh, about the subject. But no, it, no, no, no. It was one before that one. And what happened was that this uh, guy Ian Dillon, I guess he's a doctor, yeah. or professor, or something. He saw saw that, and he's. He's, and I guess during my essay, you had, you had choked on hope the way you just yeah. did there. And he said, I just love it when Sam chokes on hope. <laughs> and, then, and then you wrote me a, an email and you said, that'd be a great subject for choking on, uh, hope. Choking on hope. So I wrote you an essay and yeah. I started that essay. When I first wrote that essay, I had written the word hope, and yeah. I just wrote hope, 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 and I just, I just like, this is how Sam is going to start this. I'm going to yeah. make him read this thing until he's, you know, just a puddle on the floor, uh, and you know. Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit. So, so wrong with that? Are, are we a civilization choking on hope right now? Um. So the sun is too bright for me to look in there right now, so I'm going to have to look down here or go like this. So maybe that is a metaphor yeah. for what hope is. So, so let me go with that being a okay. metaphor for hope. Hope means you're happy that it's a sunny day. This is a beautiful sunny day. Yeah, there's there's a birds in the sky. It's over the it's top. It's over beautiful. the top, beautiful, spectacular <laughs> day. The problem is the sun is blinding you, and you're not able to see stuff because you are <laughs> you are in that that hope thing, and it is just right in your face, and it's it, it's so overwhelming what? to you that it completely closes your door to anything that's real. You know, it's the blue pill, red pill. It, it's Plato's cave. You know, um, it's. It's, you know, it's just a sort of classic thing. And the, the thing that I like is um, what Pandora's, Pandora's box, right? So um, that hope, um, uh, probably some of the, your viewers know this, but hope, when Pandora opened that box, right, and released all the evils into the world, and she's like, like opens the box. It's like, oh, there's death and <laughs> disease, and you know, it's like, oh, right. She goes, I better close this box, right? And she like runs over to the box. She closes the box. <laughs> and one uh, evil remains. One thing left in that box, right? That that didn't escape, right? Yeah. And that thing was hope, wow. right? So, so hope was considered to be an evil, you know, way, <laughs> way, way back, and. Um, the point was that, that the original meaning of hope was deceptive expectation, yeah. right? Hope means deceptive expectation. It means setting you up to believe something, somebody intentionally deceiving you to believe you, they, to deceive uh, you. They, so for their gain, for some value or benefit they will receive from you not believing that thing, whether it's a used car salesman, uh, you know. Or, a, uh, or an energy revolution. Or energy revolution, whatever <laughs> the, the thing is. Like, I... I all right. Solar energy gives me hope, right? Uh, um, you know what gives me hope? What gives you hope? It, I do want to know. That Catherine Hayhoe gives me hope. Not Catherine Hayhoe. Oh, yes. Catherine <laughs> Hayhoe. She, 
if anybody right. was ever full of deceptive expectation, <laughs> right? There's nobody on the planet who who I is, need to bring Catherine in on who is time. better at deceptive expectation with regard to climate change than than Miss uh, Miss Catherine Hayo. So, you know, this is this is uh, a way of lying to people. Right, and there is this this interesting uh, 2017 study uh, in Harvard, and I, I read a second source of this too, that compared hope to despair as motivating factors. Right, and they found that the people who had hope, um, you know, hope that we could save the planet, hope that that solar energy or wind or, or recyclables or green cars or or Elon Musk, whatever, if you have hope you are less likely to be an activist. Because by virtue mm. of having hope, you believe the problem yeah. can be solved. By somebody and by, else. by virtue of believing it can be solved, it means somebody else can yeah. solve yeah. it, right? Yeah. So, so they actually found that this strong correlation between dismotivation to action, to positive <laughs> benefit of the planet, and having <laughs> hope, right? So it, it turns out that the doomers the people who are realists, who are honest, who actually see what the future of the planet is going to be, are more motivated, like myself, right? I am, I don't know, you might not be, I'm motivated, right? I, I spend a lot of my time being a volunteer, but are more motivated in general than the people who have hope, right? The people who, who are realists, who understand the predicament we're in, right? And understand um, the real futures that are possible like what are the real futures that are possible for this planet are more likely to be activists. And I certainly fall into that, right? I, I am exactly, that, it, that describes me exactly, right? I am an activist because I am a doomer. I am an activist uh, for the planet because I am a doomer. I, I want to preserve the planet for whatever comes after us. And, and I, I do what I can. And, uh, well, uh, so, we, we, we mentioned this a couple of days ago, uh, you do have uh, children and grandchildren. I do have children and grandchildren, yes I do. So talk, let's talk about how old are your grandchildren right now? Um, a four-year-old, a seven-year-old, uh, I believe one is 13 turning 14 soon and one might be 17-ish. So yeah. why aren't you A, curled up in a fetal position in the bottom of your closet, or be on a homicidal rage. One of the, I would be, if I had four grandchildren right now, I would be either curled up in a fetal position with depression in the bottom of my closet, or I would be going to prison for, for, for probably murder one. Well, that's too bad, Sam. Uh, I'm really sorry for you. That must feel really bad for I, I, you. No, it doesn't feel bad because I don't have any I don't understand. So, so what do you think I should feel? I, I don't know. What do you, uh, uh, with, with the knowledge you're carrying with you. Well, so, so what can you do? I mean, look, the, the people who come today and want to blame our generation, the way we blamed our parents, our generation, right? I mean, but for the actions we took in the 70s, but, or in 60s, and, and you know, DDT, and, and um, Clean Air Act, and, and uh, Endangered Species Act, and, you know, banning uh, ozone-depleting uh, floro, uh, floro yeah. fluorocarbons, right? And on and on, right? Uh, cleaning up the river so they weren't catching on fire, and, um, you know, getting lead out of paints and lead out of gasoline. You take all of those things, right? But for everything we did, I wouldn't have grandkids, right? Because the planet would not be able to support humans anymore. It would have been destroyed, right? But for everything we did, our generation did, the 40-year-olds and the 30-year-olds and on down, right, would probably not be here today to, to lodge the complaints about our generation. So what do I feel about this generation being the one who sort of, uh, um, you know, again, I'm going to use the word, the most fuck generation of all time? Right, my grandkids are now in the most fuck generation. Yeah, generation in the, fuck, generation, generation. Yeah, F. yeah, we're not generation X or Y or Z. We're generation, generation F. Generation well, F. There, there's <laughs> no question. My grandkids are in generation F. Well, how does that? How do you deal with that? Well, I deal that with that by saying, when those kids are ready to hear, I'll tell them. But I'm not going to force it on them. Yeah. You know, I I am not the kind of person who wants to uh, take away whatever magic moments they have in their life. Um, from them, let them have that magic. Uh, you know, that's part of life is being a kid and, and 
believing in Santa Claus and, and you know, getting a new bike and uh, going on road trips or whatever it is, you know, let them have that life. Yeah. And, and when they're ready for it, they will, just like we learned about it, right? I mean, we're, we're uh, it doesn't feel good to know this stuff. It's not like you're happy to know this, right? It's, I'm not, it's not like I expect my grandkids to be more depressed than me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not depressed. I, I should say this that. This man is not at they, all depressed. That they, they should be sadder than me, yeah. right? I mean, I, I will own how sad I am about all this stuff. Uh, and I, you know, I don't, I don't think that somehow the measure of sadness they experience will um, be, should be measured against mine. But I mean, what they are going to experience is this, this um, you know, the end of, they're going to experience the sea level rise. They're going to experience extreme temperatures. They're going to experience famine and, and, you know, loss of food resources. They're going to, uh, civil war. They're, you know, the list of things Generation F is going to experience that, that, you know, we're not likely yeah. to experience. It's just mind blowing, and I don't know. I just have to hope they're resilient enough to do whatever they can to to make that work for them as best as they'll be able to. But but there there's no optimism, you know, you can have for that generation. And uh, I mean, that's that's it is sad. Yeah, no question, it's sad. But uh, you know, I don't feel as though um, by having grandkids somehow I have created more suffering. You know. Everybody suffers. Every animal is going to suffer, whether I had grandkids or not. Uh, Elephants are going to suffer, and yeah. coyotes are going to suffer. And well, maybe you know, coyotes are doing pretty good. Well, our mountain lions. We have mountain lions around here. You know, what is a mountain lion going to eat locally, except for our dogs and things <laughs> in this area? I mean, it's it's everything on the planet is going to suffer. There everything you go. So, uh, all right, the battery warning light. Okay, we are 56 and a half minutes into this. So. As I end every one of my interviews, uh, I should interviews. know this, and I don't. You don't. You don't know how the the, the final question. Uh, every, I think I remember it. Every single interview I have ever. The thirty second elevator no, speech. It, no, it, it's a sixty second. So if you were, if, unbelievably, you had the mainstream media, and he actually, and this man actually has already gotten the attention of the BBC. Uh, this is how quick he's rising through the doomosphere. If you had, uh, you know, the mainstream media with a camera in your face right now instead of Collapse Chronicles giving you 60 minutes, and you have 60 seconds to send out the Elliot Jacobson uh, message to planet Earth in the closing hours of 2022, give us your 60 seconds. So I'm not going to try and convince you of anything. I mean, that's what's happened in the last hour. So I just want to give the positive message that I give, that there are three things that we do. We want to be of service, find ways to be a volunteer. We want to be generous as much as you can. Give, right? Give clothes, give food, give money. Be generous to those in need who have less than you, and be kind. Spend every single day you can, being as kind as you can in every way you can. So that is my way of going through life, and that's what I would hope uh, to leave people with here. All right, that was about 42 seconds. I think it was 42 seconds. I'll sit here for 18 seconds and say <laughs> nothing and stare into the camera. So anyway, guys, uh, we're going to wrap this up on this spectacularly gorgeous day. And uh, Elliot Jacobson, I really, really uh, appreciate you, uh, everything you're doing, and it is Good to have a new friend, and so uh, don't be a strange. Something tells me this man will not be a stranger at Collapse Chronicles, and of course he has his own CC YouTube channel. Just plug your plug your channel. Right, the Climate Casino CC. Right, yes, so Climate Casino on YouTube on uh, and also my uh, website climatecasino.net. All right, so go over there and subscribe, and uh, we have another voice. And with that, we're going to wrap this up. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys.